Appreciate all of the teens that have been on the AIM trips as well here from our church. I know that you guys have uh, sacrificed a lot to go, and parents, you have too. So really proud of them and what they've done and what they're doing. This morning, we're going to be talking about almost revival. So would you please stand with me as we read from the Word of the Lord. We're actually going to be reading scriptures from two different chapters from Second Chronicles. Uh, we're going to be reading one scripture from Second Chronicles 23:16, and then another, another two more from Second uh, Chronicles 24, which are verses 17 and 18. Second Chronicles 23:16 states, "Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king, that they should be the Lord's people." And in Second Chronicles 24:17 and 18, after the death of Jehoiada. Jehoiada, sorry, the leader of Judah came and the leaders of Judah came to, and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespasses. Let's pray. Father, we uh, pray that we would go beyond almost revival and into revival. I pray that you would continue to work a mighty work in our lives just as you started this morning. You continue to guide and direct us, and I pray for those that still have a heavy burden on their shoulders, that today would be the day that they release that burden. Today would be the day that they choose to pick up the light yoke that Christ has provided through us, through His blood. And Lord, if there's any in the sound of my voice this morning that don't know Jesus as Savior, God, I pray that today, again, would be the day of their salvation, that they wouldn't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow's not promised them, but today would be the day that they choose to follow Jesus with all of their mind, heart, soul, and strength. And for those that may be on the fence, God, would you get their feet back on your side? Would you make it so that today would be the day that they choose to no longer play in the devil's playground, but rather instead to follow after you with everything, with their all, and Lord, for those that are serving you, I pray that today would be a day of encouragement as they continue to run that race, as they continue to press towards the prize. We're just asking for great and mighty blessings to flow in this place today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. Jehoiada. In June of 1995, after years of planning and research, costing multiple billions of dollars, the Space Shuttle Discovery was scheduled to launch on the first of seven missions, which would rendezvous with the space, space station Mir, the Russian space station Mir, in preparation for the launch of the International Space Station in 1997. Now, the date had been carefully chosen. Weather conditions were favorable, but some strange noises were coming from launch pad 39B. Upon investigation, technicians discovered about six dozen holes in the insulating covering of the main external fuel tank. All of the complex planning and high-priced preparations were useless as the mission ground to a halt because a family of woodpeckers decided that the space shuttle looked like a good place to live. What a bummer. The story of Joash is a fascinating one, and his reign was filled with promise. And after a steady decline in the kingdom from the time of David, uh, a bloody coup had taken place upon a death of her son, the king. Josiah's grandmother had killed all of the royal family and set herself up upon the throne. But Joash's great aunt, great aunt had snuck the infant Joash out of the nursery and hid him with his nurse in a secret place in the temple of God. When Joash was seven years old, the priest Je uh, Jehoiada, I'll get his name straight eventually, Jehoiada, staged an uprising against the wicked and idolatrous grandmother, placing the boy Joash upon his right rightful throne. The temple of Baal in the city was destroyed. The priest of Baal was put to death. The covenant was reestablished and, another, and proper temple worship was reestablished as well. It looked as if another golden age was coming for the kingdom of Judah. And it looked as if revival was coming as well. The plans had been laid, the process had begun, but then something went wrong. You could say that woodpeckers were discovered in the fuel tank of the revival. So the question is, for this morning, is why? Why did such a perfect opportunity for revival slip away? What kept God from pouring out His blessing? What did Josiah do wrong? 
the reasons these questions are important to me this morning is that I believe we're in a time that in many ways are similar to the beginning of Joash's reign. A time that looks as if we could be on the brink of revival. Yes, our society has experienced moral decay quite rapidly, I might add. And yes, that there are things, terrible things that have happened, but there are positive signs as well, signs that people are growing discontent with the status quo. After the tragedy of 9-11, there was great spiritual hunger. Even here in our own community, in our own church, people began to cry out for revival. And I think that it's important for us to look out and look to the lesson of Josiah, or Joash, of all. The, the almost but not quite revival. The reason we can look at this and look at this story of Joash is so that we can see the traps to avoid and look for things that may quench revival. In the story of Joash, four things seem to stand out as a roadblock, and we're going to cover these this morning. Number one, if you're taking notes, is follow the leader faith. Four things that quench revival. Follow the leader faith. Number two is neglecting the strongholds. Neglecting the strongholds. Number three, surrender of the sacred. Surrender of the sacred. And number four, ignoring the call to repentance. So let's dive right in to number one. Follow the leader of faith. Second Chronicles 24.2 states, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years. Jehoiada was the, uh, the priest and he instructed him. Second Chronicles 23.16 says, Jehoiada then made a covenant that, that he and the people and the king would be the Lord's people. Second Chronicles 24, 17 and 18, we just read these. After the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king and he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and worshipped Asherah poles and idols. And because of their sin, God's anger came against Judah and Jerusalem. And as long as Je Jehoiada was around to guide him, Joash did okay. Not perfect, but he did do okay. And one of the things that we need to consider this morning and look at is it seems that as if Joash had very little conviction in him. It wasn't possible for Jeho Jehoiada to make a covenant on behalf of the king. Why? Because the king needed to de dedicate himself to the Lord. And it doesn't look like he ever really did that. And then as soon as Jehoiada is gone, Joash is easily led astray by those who wanted him to turn against the Lord to reinstate idol worship and to mix it with the worship of the one true God. Listen, children, you have to make your faith with the Lord God your own. You cannot ride the coattails of your parents' faith into heaven. It doesn't work. Joash was a follower, and that can be okay, as long as you're a follower with conviction. But Joash seemed to be a follower primarily, primarily because he had no convictions. And the same danger exists for us today. It's tempting to follow the crowd or even follow a charismatic leader, but that's dangerous even when the leader's a good one. You must have a personal relationship with the Lord. And if your committed is, uh, commitment is leader-based, then it's easy to be led astray or turned around by some other leaders. It's also dangerous because people will let you down. Pastor Jason will let you down. Just ask my wife. <laughs> we often think of historical revivals in terms of leaders, uh, Jonathan Edwards, D.L. Moody, and Smith Wigglesworth, etc. We could go down the list. Revival comes because the people desired enough to repent of their sin and seek God in prayer and with changed hearts and lives. That is why revival comes. A leader may play some part in parting vision under God's anointing to bring revival, but revival will never happen where people seek to ride the coattails of a leader into revival. For that reason, I believe that follow the leader of faith is a roadblock to revival. Revival has to take place in each or every one of our hearts. It has to be a personal decision that I will lay down the things of this world and I will choose to follow after Jesus Christ no matter what, no matter what the cost, I will follow him. I will follow him into revival. No matter what the fires of trials are all around me, I will choose to follow after Jesus Christ. It is individually based. 
But when we come together corporately with that one thought in mind, it reminds me of Acts chapter 4, when the disciples came back together. And they, told, they said, Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy child, Jesus. And as they prayed, the place was shaken. Why? Because they were with one heart and with one accord. They chose that day to have one thought and one mind and that was they were going to do what God asked them to do no matter the cost, even when they were being threatened with their lives. Hmm. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Follow the leader of faith as a roadblock to revival. The second roadblock is neglecting the stronghold. 2 Kings 12.3. Oh, this is a tough one here this morning. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continue to offer sacrifices and burn incenses there. We see this pattern over and over again throughout the Old Testament. And as you're reading through the the Old Testament, you may think, why didn't they just take care of the idols? Why didn't they just cut them down? Oh, what's his name? Gideon. Oh, Gideon. When the Lord came to Gideon and Gideon had doubts, he set out the fleece and the Lord's like, yes, this is what I want you to do. And he told him to go cut down the idol in the grove and Gideon's like, oh boy. So he went and did it at night. But you know what? At least he went and did it. He cut down the idol. I love his dad's response. Mind you, this was his dad's idol inside his dad's field, inside of his dad's grove. And the people were so ticked. <laughs> They were so mad, they wanted to kill Gideon. You want to get people mad at you? You really want to get people mad at you? Stop pushing over their sacred cows. Start pushing on their idols. Start cutting down idols. Ooh, they're going to flare up. That religious spirit is going to come up and say, You can't touch that. I'm allowed to do those things. That's not evil. Hoggy wash playing at a devil's playground, you're going to get burned. Let me get back to my notes. So the high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burnt incenses there. That was 2 Kings 12.3. The high places were centers of idol worship on mountains and hilltops. Poles to the goddess Asherah were erected. Altars similar to the ones in the temple for animal and even human sacrifices were often found there. They weren't in the cities, and the pagan priests who operated these franchises were often very politically powerful. Once Joash reached an age when he could have made it, been aware and done something about them, he simply wasn't willing to make the effort. Also remember that idol worship had become more prevalent than genuine worship. And you can look back through the books of Kings and Chronicles and they make it clear that many of the kings like to play both ends of the field, keeping a pagan God on one side just in case if the God of Israel didn't come through on the other side. Boy, talk about a lack of faith. To destroy the high places would mean to give up their insurance plan. You may be thinking, Pastor, what does that have to do with us? We haven't got any high places. We don't worship idols. We may not have a stirrup pole sitting out in our parking lots or in our backyards or down at the marketplace. But do we have places hidden in the hills of our lives, places where God is not sovereign? How about habits? Do we have habits that are not pleasing to the Lord or practicing sins? I love this one. God knows my heart. You are absolutely right. God knows, does know your heart and that should scare the snot out of you. I have heard God knows my heart. I don't know how many times, and that scares me to my core just to think about it. Yes, God knows our heart. The word even says that the heart is desperately wicked above all. Who can know it? God knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows what's hidden inside of our hearts. What are the places that are hidden? Temptations that we indulge. 
How about the plans we've made for our lives that we don't want the Lord messing with? Those insurance plans, just in case if God doesn't come, and doesn't come through. What about your dignity and your reputation? Are you willing for those to be brought low? Are you ready to surrender every corner of your life to God's sovereignty? Or are you hanging on to the high places? There is a story that is told of a child who came to school filthy every day. The teachers, appalled that anyone could let their child come to school that way, were discussing the situation. One said, that mother doesn't love their child. Another one replied, I think she does. She just doesn't hate dirt. We may say we love the Lord, but until we hate the dirt and tear down the high places, there will be no revival. Until we hate the dirt and tear down those high places, there will be no revival. That is a purpose-driven thing in our life that should take place or we're like, I choose to tear down this idol. I choose to tear down this thing that has cost me so much time, so much energy, so much money, so much of my life. If we know that God is displeased with it, why hang on to it? Tear it down. Cut it down. Your flesh ain't going to like it. It'll scream. It'll be like the, the people that wanted to come kill Gideon. What you doing that for? I love Gideon's dad's response. He said, you know what? If your God's real, let him deal with Gideon. Whew, that's good news right there. Who do we serve? We serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when we choose to cut down those idols, the Lord will set up a standard against the enemy so that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord lifts up that standard against him. And we don't have to fear about any weapon that the enemy brings against us because God is greater than any weapon the enemy forms against us. And where where people are being brought low through the enemy's tactics, the Lord can take us and lift us up high. He can raise us up because he soars us with wings like eagles. Amen? That's good news right there. But we've got to choose to cut down those idols. The next roadblock to revival is that which we should never, which should never be surrendered, and that's surrender of the sacred. Surrender of the sacred. Second Kings twelve seventeen and eighteen. About this time, Hazel, king of Aram, went up and attacked Gath and captured it. Then he turned to attack Jerusalem. But Joash, king of Judah, took all the sacred objects dedicated by his fathers. Jehoshaphat, Jerom, and Isaiah, the kings of Judah, and the gifts he himself had dedicated, and all the gold found in the treasuries of the temple of the Lord and of the royal palace, and he sent them to Hazel, king of Aram, who then withdrew from Jerusalem. When faced with a crisis, Joash doesn't turn to the Lord. He doesn't call upon the nation to repent and fast and pray. Instead, he surrenders the sacred objects, the things dedicated to the Lord. He uses them as a bribe to get his enemy and the enemy of the Lord to leave him alone. This is another example of Joash's weakness and the lack of resolve. What about us? How does that apply to us? Well, when push comes to shove, what in your life gives way? Is it things that are sacred to the Lord? When the budget's tight, what's the first thing that gets cut? When something's really neat happening is on Sunday morning, where do you find yourself? When your daily schedule is tight and the laundry, does the laundry wait or does the Lord? The world around us tells us that the sacred has to go. You don't believe me? Hear the words of Bill Gates. I'm sure you remember him. Founder and CEO of Microsoft. He put it this way in an interview. Just in terms of allocation of time resource, religion is not very efficient. There is a lot more I could be doing on a Sunday morning, end quote. Here's a man who understood earthly investments but didn't have a clue about eternity. He's worried about a couple hours on Sunday, three, even four hours. What if you were to spend eight hours on a Sunday? Wow, what an investment. Your return, and let's imagine it, that you, there's eight hours and there's 52 weeks in a year, Right? We're going to do simple math because I'm up here standing in front of you. But 50, okay? <laughs> What's 8 times 5? 40, right? So that's 400 hours. Is that right? So let's say you live to be 100 and you've spent 400 hours a year, right? Times 100. How, 
40,000, right? 40,000 hours. Okay, now you may think, wow, 40,000 hours out of my life? Are you kidding me? Oh, let's back up a little bit. 40,000 hours, yes. Now, we've got 40,000 hours of your life here and then all of eternity for the rest of the What's more important? Is 40,000 hours of your life worth all of eternity? Is it worth it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't take a genius or a rocket scientist or Bill Gates to figure this out. But you really have to sit down and start doing the math. And that was just eight hours of your day. Now, we don't spend eight hours here, but just think if a revival happens and you were to spend eight hours here, it's still nothing compared to eternity. Are you with me? Okay, good. Now, I, I, I don't want you to hear what I just said as some sort of legalism that you have to do your time. Okay, don't, don't misunderstand me. Our salvation is not based on works, but works do reflect our salvation. Okay? And if we're earnestly seeking a deeper walk with the Lord, if we're hungry for revival then all of our resources, time, talent, and treasures must belong first of all to Jesus Christ. Must belong first of all to the King of kings and Lord of lords. If we surrender the sacred for the sake of convenience, we shouldn't expect revival. The last roadblock comes from Second Chronicles, chapter 24, 19 through 22. Although the Lord sent prophets to the people to bring them back to him, and though they testified against them, they would not listen. Then the Spirit of the Lord God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoda, Je- Jehoda, sorry, the priest. I'll get his name right. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. But they plotted against him, and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father, Jehoiada, had shown him, but killed his son, who said as he lay dying, May the Lord see this and call you to account. Even after Joash had strayed far from the path that the Lord had marked out for him, God in his mercy sent messengers to warn him, to invite him back to, to offer revival and restoration. But Joash didn't want to hear what he was doing was wrong, so he killed the messenger. Bruce, would you come this morning? I believe that it is God's will for us to experience revival. I believe that that is always God's will. But I also believe that unless as we as individuals and as a community of faith heed the call to repentance we will never experience all what God wants us to. Not because that God has established a a pro quo system, you act right and I'll bless you, but simply because the blessing of God and intimacy with Him are simply incompatible with an unrepentant life. And I'm going to say that one more time. The blessings of God and intimacy with Him are simply incompatible with an unrepentant life. I believe that the Holy Spirit has been working in convicting power, even as I've been speaking this morning. I believe that there's people all over this place, including me, perhaps everyone here has felt the heavy hand of God upon them and convicting of high places that need to come down, of sacred things that need to be destroyed and surrendered and stuff that needs, sacred things that need to be restored unto the Lord. You can choose to ignore God's call to repentance and continue with life as usual. You can choose to kill the messenger and simply choose by never coming back here again. Or you can choose to surrender. And I believe with all my heart that God is ready and anxious even to move in revival power in this community, inside this church. I believe that His plans are made. The shuttle is on the launch pad. But there are some woodpeckers that need to be dealt with that have been hammering out some holes in our lives, that have made things in the insulation that we've had, in the coverings that we've had, that have made damage to those things. And the way that we deal with them is through repentance, through general sorrow, a genuine sorrow of sin, 
sorrow that is so genuine that we change our behavior. Would you please stand with me this morning? I don't want to rush this altar call. Trust me, we've got some time. But if there are high places in your life that the Lord is dealing with you right now about, would you take the time this morning and seek the Father? Would you take the time to give those over to Him, to let Him repair those holes that have been made? You may have felt the urge to come to the altar earlier to release a burden. Do it. God's saying, come to me. You may think, well, I just want to do this in my seat. Listen, there is something about a step of faith. There is something about making a physical step towards that altar. And it may happen as soon as you start to get out of that aisle. It may happen as soon as you get right here at the front. But I promise you it will happen. If the Lord is calling you to drop that heavy load, it will happen. God is wanting to take those heavy loads. I believe also that there's somebody here this morning, you've been dealing with some sort of an addiction. Today is the day to be set free. The word specifically says, he who the son sets free is free indeed. And I believe that even deals with the physical addictions in our lives, no matter what those may be, with whatever you're struggling with. Would you take it to the Lord this morning? As Bruce leads us in a song, these altars are open. If you want prayer, I'll be more than happy to pray with you. But I really believe that if we truly want to see revival this morning start, it's going to be on an individual basis. And we're going to have to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I repent. I surrender all to you. Come this morning.
Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we surrender all to you this morning. We're trusting you for revival in our hearts. Today we surrender the high places. We cut down the poles of idolatry. We grind the altars of idolatry into pieces right now. We turn our eyes, our thoughts, our whole beings towards you. And we worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, I thank you right now that you are replacing the heavy burdens with the light ones. Lord, I thank you that you are releasing the captives. Yes, I see that. There's, we're going to sing a worship song. We're going to, we're going to sing. And the, the, the image just came to mind of Saul and Pilate. Saul, I'm sorry, Paul and Silas. I see, I see this so vividly. That they're in jail. They're in stocks. They're in bonds. They're, their backs are beaten and whipped. They're, 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 they're in a bad spot. And it's at midnight, and you may be at the midnight hour where everything just seems really dark. You're in chains. We are going to worship the Lord. And just like when Saul, Paul and Silas, when they were in that jail and they began to worship the Lord at midnight, those chains, those shackles broke free. There was a great earthquake and there was a freedom that took place. And it not only freed them, but it freed every single prisoner in that place. And I believe that every prisoner in this place is about to receive their freedom this morning as we worship the Lord. And I want you to worship Him with your all. Like this is it. Like you're getting ready to check out. Like this is the, the rapture's about to happen. So let's worship Him and believe Him that the chains are going to fall. In Jesus' name. Let's do it. Hallelujah. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Revival in our hearts. We have decided to follow Jesus. He has given us a light yoke. We have given him the heavy yoke and he's given us something greater in return, something easy to carry. And he is there. He has set us free. Amen. Go forth in this freedom today and share it with others. You are dismissed and bless the Lord. Hallelujah.